A very good evening, everybody. Welcome to 360 Digit MG's uh, channel where we discuss new things uh, every day and uh, try to increase the engagement that we have with our participants and uh, offer them a lot of things, uh, you know, a wide spectrum of uh, content for them to consume and uh, become even more better. So these sessions are what we call the incremental change on your learning curve. So there's going to be a steep increase in your learning curve when you do the program. That is whether you do the data science or certification or the professional program, that is going to have a steep uh, increase. These things, the things like the interview preparedness or uh, deployment or any of these things will make incremental changes. And at, uh, at the stage of uh, being um, you know, employed, uh, when, when the chips are down and when you have to compete with people of the similar ranking, all right, um, from the masses, what makes you slightly above the rest is the knowledge that is being imparted by these sessions. So it's very, very important that uh, you know, people must attend these sessions and uh, try to gather as much information as possible. So on that note, uh, let's begin. So we are having this series on uh, deployment, right? So we learn um, data science, we learn machine learning, um, machine learning models, we supervise unsupervised, we uh, you know, build it, we look at the accuracies, we tune it, hyperparameter tuning, all that. Finally, we come up with the best model. And that is where the, you know, the curtain ends. But what happens afterwards? All right, do they live happily ever after? We wonder. So what happens after the curtain ends is what we are going to be discussing. And uh, as uh, uh, many of you might have seen the last week's session, if not, please do watch it on our YouTube channel. So last week we had done the deployment on the local system, all right, which is the, probably the first stage and uh, you must know about that as well. But that is not a very practical thing because in real life in production environment, it will invariably be uh, you know, in the cloud. So uh, we have Sharad, the expert of uh, many, many projects he has done. Um, I'm assuming he has lost count of that. Uh, and of late, guiding uh, concurrently many projects. So Sharad, I'd like you to take the center stage now. And I'd like you to, you know, guide us uh, first about what is it that we are going to, you know, teach us about uh, the cloud-based deployment, and then subsequently how it is done. In the meanwhile, I'll be interrupting you. I'll be looking at the YouTube channel. I'll be interrupting you with any questions people may have because you will be focused there. So please go ahead, Mr. Sharat. Uh, thank you, Nitin. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the channel. And uh, hope you are taking the advantage of the channels and spreading the news. Um, sharing is caring. And you will learn more when you share the knowledge. That, that's the motto that, that keeps me going, especially, um, right? Uh, that, that's how I get motivated. And that's why I'm in the training industry as, as well, uh, of course. Uh, my primary job is, is working on the projects, of course. Um, so like what we have seen in the last session um, on once the model is developed, um, when you are trying to give the solution to the client, obviously we will not try to give the client a very simple code. You'll simplify it, right? You do all the experimentation initially, you'll try to come up with one standard code after all the uh, fine tuning. And obviously your client does not expect this and you don't expect your client to have the knowledge of the programming skills. This is where the... Uh, Right, uh, the UI comes into the picture. Uh, web interfaces, mobile interfaces, right? Mobile application interfaces, all those things come into the picture. Now, the data scientists basically are not uh, software developers. That, that's that's how I would like to treat them. They are not software developers. They are people who have technical capabilities, mathematical capabilities, and most importantly, the business knowledge. So when we try to develop a solution using machine learning techniques, 
we would definitely want to give the solution to the customers in a much user, better user, uh, in, uh, with better user interface so that they can start really using it. And uh, Python, yes, that is the go-to tool. And we have like last session seen how we can use Python's Flask library to come up with a very simple web framework. It, it helps us to develop the basic UI, which is required for customers to actually see what we have developed and how do they use it and all that. Once this is done, at a production level, probably you'll bring in software developers to enhance your UIs and all that. that uh, that's a different ball game altogether. Let's let's take those steps uh, probably at a later uh, stage if, if that comes under our scope. Um, the scope is increasing. That's the reason why we are also learning Python Flask. And I have shown you in the last session on how to deploy a very simple code um, after doing all the experimentation on a local machine having some UI. So we will create the web interface in the back end the engine works. And when the user, when the end user or the customer is trying to feed in new data, the system will give you the results. That, that's all. You pass as an end user, you pass input and you get the results. That's what we need. Irrespective of what application you are developing, right? Now, Today, I'm going to talk about how do we deploy this using the most sought out or most popularly used tools, which are, of course, open source predominantly. That's what we are going to use. Of course, there are certain tools which can right, be upgraded for uh, some customized services also. But we will be typically using all those mandatory tools, I should say, for a data scientist uh, to have their, uh, these tools in their armory. And uh, let me proceed. Let me let, let just quickly walk you through with these tools. I'll give you what is what and all that. And then we will talk about how do we use these tools in deploying a solution and why we have to use it. That is more important uh, point that you will uh, you'll always be learning. So let me uh, share my screen and then I will walk you through the important tools. If you look at this, uh, the slide that I'm talking about here, uh, the presentation that you're seeing, is basically having the mandatory tools that are required. Right? For example, Python. This is the go-to tool. Of course, every data scientist in today's world has to kind of use Python programming language. They, they, there are um, instances or projects which do use other tools like SAS or you, you can talk about MATLAB or um, uh, SPSS or, or you talk about R programming for that matter. But Python is the go-to tool because of its various advantages. I, I'm not going to talk about those things, but yeah, you, if you want, you can refer to the um, videos which are there on the 360 Digit MG channel for learning more about Python as well. Then Flask application, this is basically allowing us to do web development, right? So we are not software developers, but using this, we will be doing that web development as well. Next comes for a continuous training. Any machine learning algorithms need training. And we are going to use the historical data for doing the machine learning training. This, this is something everybody knows, right? From a data science community, you all know about this. So moving on, what if I get new data? So I'll, I'll tell you a scenario. Uh, the model that I was basically working on, the project that I was working on and I was referring to as part of the previous session, I will stick to the same uh, use case. Of course, I cannot share the entire data and entire use case. I'll, I'll probably, uh, uh, right, I've shown you only some small sample data set for you, which is kind of a publicly available, of course. So I will be continuing using the same data as a reference for discussing about the project uh, implementation. So the project was in automobile sector where we were trying to uh, help the client, uh, our client, um, establish good standards in the business, right? So let us try and understand the second sales business. 
in, in automobile industry. That, that's picking up, especially after COVID, it has picked up randomly because of people inclination to purchase vehicles from two wheelers to four wheelers because of, of, of you'll have that closed uh, vicinity, right? Uh, if, you, if you ride a car. So from that perspective, the sales have uh, almost increased like three to four times, you can refer to the numbers. So this is where our client comes in and uh, right, they had this challenge where they wanted to have some stream streamlined process to define the prices. So we decided that we will try and predict the fuel efficiency, right? In India, we call this as mileage for a liter fuel. And as part of this, we we looked into many features. I will be talking about around four to five features uh, to explain certain things, right? And uh, we will be using regression analysis for the model building. You have seen uh, the code also. If you if you want to refer to the code, refer to the previous video of the series, uh, the first video of the series, so that you can get a quick glance on what what is the code and all that. Now let us assume that version one data, which is historical data, is around 5,000 records. Assume, okay? The sample data we have taken is very small data, but assume that we have 5,000 records. Now I have developed a machine learning model and using the CRISP MLQ methodology, I have developed this algorithm, we have trained, we have tuned the model, and we have chosen the best model. Okay. So this was linear regression model. Again, assume. So assume the best model is this. Now I have to deploy this model so that the client starts using it. Now assume we have done this in October 2022. Right? Now next month. November 2022, right? We will have to relook into this particular model because in October, we will get new data. The customers are going to come to the client and th their clients and their, right? They, they try to uh, do the business and thereby there is new data which is generated. So for November, we need to, the, the strategy that we implemented is to, revisit the model with new data at every month intervals. So I need to have retraining done. Now this time I will have to use the old data, but along with that, I need to have new data included. Let's say I have 2000 records now. In one month, we have 2000 new records. The model was used for doing predictions, but after the events completed, now we are in November, assume. So we will get the actual results also. And that goes into the data, into the database. So we are going to capture this entire new data and we will have to do the retrain. There are again, different strategies for new training. We'll talk about that at a later, probably some other sessions, uh, incremental training uh, or, or complete training, full training, right? So there are different strategies that we can implement for now. Assume that we are retraining, complete retraining is happening. That means I need to revisit the code, right? So this is continuous training that we need to do so that we can capture the drift that is happening in the business. And the model has to try and capture that drift and give us the more accurate results. Now, every time we want to do this, obviously you cannot say that hey, I will take the entire code and right, uh, push that into the client's environment every time. It, it may not be that easy to revisit the entire code. This is the reason why we need to have a code repository. This way, you'll have a centralized location where your code is sitting. There might be multiple people who will be working on this code, right? Everybody is investing their own code, time and generating the code. So you'll have a centralized location where all the updates come into the picture. And you can also maintain versioning. So this code repository by default, very popular code repository is GitHub and we will be using this GitHub repository only. 
And then we will use Heroku tool. Heroku is, is basically a platform as a service. It's a cloud-based, right? Cloud platform, you can say, or cloud framework, which allows us to simply put the entire code here to Heroku Cloud, and then entire deployment is taken care by Heroku itself. And ultimately, you will get URL, which is basically showing you the web interface that we develop using Flask application. Okay, so this is uh, how the flow is going to happen. I'll, I'll show the diagram also. I think I have a question. Okay, let me take up the question. The, the question says, why Flask is needed for Heroku? Now, Heroku is a cloud platform which is used for deployment, right? Development and deployment of your models. I'll talk about Heroku in detail also. A little bit brief information I'll, I'll show about Heroku also. But it is a cloud platform. It is not a web interface. It doesn't give you a web interface. For web interface, web development, we need to use Python Flask. You can also use any other tool, right? Node.js, Ruby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you will have machine learning model plus the HTML rendered pages which is basically created by Flask. This entire thing will be your code. This code goes and sits in Heroku via GitHub. Right? So that is the reason why we need Flask to have a web interface for your code. Heroku is just a platform which is going to take everything into the cloud uh, framework. So if I talk about the model pipeline All right i hope i have answered your question um, i'm moving on whenever we talk about model deployment right end to end a machine learning model development should always be from uh, you have to look at as right the data to end result okay this is how you'll have to see so when we talk about data the data comes from sources. Like in your, in, in, you can see in this image, we have different data sources. The data can come from social media, you can have IoT devices, Internet of Things, web sources. This could be various forms that you generate on your web platforms or your client can generate, I mean, your client interface can ask certain questions from the end users and generate the data, right? All these things. Or you can also have some flat files, off offline files that we generally deal with, like CSV, Excel, JSON files, right? So these are all could be your end, right? Um, data source platforms. We will accumulate all of them and try to ingest everything into the database. We will push the data, uh, the data into database. The database softwares could be your SQL based softwares or NoSQL based softwares. We generally call them as OLTP platform, right? Transaction platforms. So these databases are like your backend for your front end, which interacts with your client. Okay. So once the database has the data, using Python, we will try and connect to the database and extract the data, pull the data. This is, of course, your raw data from your CRISP MLQ methodology. Once the data is available, we will obviously have to do data analytics, univariate analysis, bivariate analysis, multivariate analysis, EDA basically. And then we will have to do all the pre processing, right? Once this pre processed data is, is made ready for model development, then we will use the machine learning prediction models classification or regression based on the data and uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. In our case, it was a regression problem. So we tried to do multiple regression models and then eventually we tuned and evaluated the best model. This best model will be sitting or will be deployed on Heroku Cloud. This one generates a URI 
and we can share this URI for your model usage, right? For its functionality, you're going to share that URI for your client's usage. And of course, we'll also have analytics reports which are generated um, thanks to the EDA and of course model, the results and all those things will be generated in the reports. Now the model which, which is deployed and which is being used will take in the new data from customers and it also gives the predictions. This new data, which becomes your input and the predictions which become your output are captured and sent back into the database for trying to take the feedback on the performance of the model. And over a period of time, this feedback is used to improve the model. And we'll also be able to track the drift in the model with respect to the accuracy and performances. And then thereby we will, right, monitor, that, that's, that's what monitoring and maintenance means. So once you observe this drift, then we will be able to maintain it and then upgrade it to ensure that it require, it meets the um, desired results. Uh, which, which of course we will define that as part of our CRISP MLQ first stage, right? The success criteria. So this is uh, basically the end-to-end -end pipeline, friends, and this is what you have to try and use. This is the simplistic flow that you can think of, right? But you'll have to define this. And there are interim different things come into the picture and, and based on your client in, uh, infrastructure and requirements, the pipeline can be more complex also. But this is the basic, the first level pipeline that you should look at. Now, let us talk about Hiroko. I know there are certain questions. Let me try and answer that. So what is Hiroko? Now, Hiroku, as I mentioned, is a cloud platform, right, which is used as platform as a service. That means you'll have a platform and you'll be using that entire platform. Well, when I say platform, you can say infrastructure, hardware, right? You can use that infrastructure or platform as a service so that use that service and try and, uh, right, uh, uh, get your solution implemented. And this was, uh, but when it was developed, uh, I think it was in 1997, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was developed for a, a, a platform called, I mean, a, a software called as Ruby. But eventually it has been grown so that it supports the other programming languages also. And Python, yes, definitely. That is one of the most widely used programming language from analytics perspective. And of course, it's a general purpose language. So it's used worldwide for various things. So Heroku has upgraded to all these various platforms as well. So again, Heroku is a platform as a service. It is used for deploying, running, and managing applications, which can be written in either Ruby, right, Java, Node.js, Python, all these different programming languages. This is what we are going to look into. So I'll, I'll specifically talk about Python apps. These Python apps could be right having the frameworks for UI, web interfaces like Django or Flask. We will be using Flask because it's a micro web framework. It's very easy for us to develop a web UI and right uh, integrate that with your code, machine learning code. Heroku as a platform makes your life very, very easy to deploy. It's like connecting and your code repository and clicking deploy. That's all, right? So it's as easy as clicking a button. So it is used for deploying application, right? And it connects with your code repository. We will be talking about GitHub or you can also have different other code repository platforms as well. It supports different things also. Now, it's, it's a little more technical here, but I'll quickly brush through this. I'll not spend much time. I'll quickly brush through this. When we talk about uh, Heroku, the first point is Heroku is a container-based application. Now, you might ask, what does container-based application means? What does containers mean, right? So 
We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. I will be explaining what does a container mean. So how, how does that help actually? But if you talk about Heroku components as a platform, it has multiple things, right? So th these are different components that it contains. App, this is the web application on Heroku. This is nothing but your ML model plus Flask, right? So any application that you develop becomes your application, okay? And it basically has a set of dynos. Dynos, what does dynos means? I'll talk about that. And uh, these dynos run the applications from the source code that you're going to share. And it contains a specific application URL. So it, it gives you a separate URL so that, right, it's like an edge point or, or any point through which you can communicate with the deployed application. It generates this URL. Then we have built pack. It, it is basically some uh, scripts. You can say at the back end there will be scripts, right? So build pack is like a script. And this script is actually used to create an image. Image is like your uh, um, application, executable application. You can say it's, it's like an executable, executable application. And we use that image or executable application to get the URL. So build pack is a set of scripts that are used to create the executable application, right? And it automatically determines the language. You don't have to specify it. It, it is automatically understanding what language, right? It, it is written in, right? And it also has a various built-in packs, built, uh, built packs. And if you want to enhance, you can also try and enhance it. Of course, it, it, it's customized, um, right? Built packs are there. You can procure them. You can purchase them if you need to have any customizations. Then slug, again, build pack. When we use the scripts, it generates an image, right? So you can say slug is like an image. So build pack creates a packaged copy of the application. That, that's nothing but your image, right? And these slugs or image contain all the facilities to run an application so that it can be deployed. It's like a script, you, you click and everything is ready for you. It's like a snapshot, you click it, you get the result, boom. Then dynos, this is important. Dynos are basically the containers. Like these are like engines. These are individual, isolated, virtualized. These are not physically present. These are virtually created Linux-based containers. So that means it has Linux operating system in the backend. And these are like your pods. We, we call something as pods. Individual entities. You can imagine this is like a server which is virtually created for you. Everything that requires for your application to work will be available in this containers. Right? So these are designed to ensure that the code can be successfully executed. Right? So that's your dynamic. Then we'll have dyno managers, which are basically used to manage the dynos. You can have multiple dynos. You can scale up, scale down, right? So that, that's a manager. Then we have uh, profic. Uh, proc file, sorry. A simple text file. This is a script. Again, it's, it's a simple text file. It doesn't have any extension. Proc file is the standard file name. And this proc file, right? will help the, right? It's a simple file that specifies the commands that are executed by the application at the startup, okay? It allows us to start. It lists all the process types, name commands, etc. cetera, that, that you want to execute. Then we'll have config vars. This contain uh, customizable uh, configuration data, right? And uh, this configuration data that can be changed independently for your source code. So any configurations, customizations that you want to run, you can use this configuration variables, customized variables, right? Configuration data to change it. It doesn't have any direct impact. You don't have to shut down your application or not. 
right? And the configuration is exposed to a running application via the environment variables. So internally, there will be environment variables which get impacted and there your application gets impacted, right? It's like a connection that you have. Then you have add-ons, uh, pre-configured third-party specialized tools are there, right? Value added cloud services. And uh, right, we can basically purchase these things, right? So as I mentioned, you have built packs and all those things that we're talking about, right? So it has add-on services where you have these customized value added services that you can procure for bringing in your customized services. So this is about your Hiroku uh, components and there are many other components that you probably will see. Of course, as an end user, you'll not be able to actually use them. In the back end. all these things are used. You don't have to really right, uh, talk about all these things as a data scientist if you want to use Heroku application. Just for uh, high level up, uh, right, information, I'm, I'm trying to share all this, uh, the, uh, the document. Okay, now, moving on, I'll talk about containerization. The data science community that, that we are uh, right, living in, the, the knowledge that we are accruing uh, is predominantly from a machine learning perspective. But the biggest problem is once you develop the application, it has to basically be deployed, right? It has to go into some other system or some other person has to use it. This is a very common problem for any application, not just ML, ML code. This is a common problem for many, many applications that we have. So what should we do here? If I say, hey, I developed my application in my local machine, I trained it. Flask application also I have developed. In my computer, it is working fine. And I share this entire code to, let's say, the testing team, or probably they say, I'm giving this code to you. You started running this code, and you will see a lot of things breaking up. I'm pretty sure you, everyone has experienced this, right? Some or the other way, there will be some or the other error coming up saying that the package is missing or the version mismatch happening or this is not there or that is not there, isn't it? So the code that we are developing is going to have some functionality issues if the system is changed, right? So what we do when we are trying to deploy is to ensure that irrespective of what is the computer or what is the server or what is the location basically, the code is getting deployed. If the code has to work without issues as expected as the system was working or the application was working in my computer, I ensure that the code is given in a complete container as, as a single pod right, single entity, which includes everything that is required, irrespective of where you are running, on what platform you are running the code or our applications. So all the dependencies, including your worst dependencies, the Python libraries, the dependency function, uh, versions, everything that we require is contained within the single application software that we are going to share, right? So we are creating a container, okay? Now this concept is basically given birth to the containerization concept. So containerization is basically a process, a method, which allows us to have OS level virtualization for application deployment or application development. And this concept is predominantly is used for running and developing the applications which are getting shared between multiple systems. So it's like testing team is different, development team is different, uh, the uh, uh, production teams is different, right? So development team says, hey, this code is working. Testing team, when they start, they say it's not working for us. Then Somehow you fix the issues and testing team is saying, okay, now it is working. They take it to production environment. In production, again, it fits. So there is a lot of these gaps that we'll see, isn't it? So in order to have this issue clarified, the issue removed out of the question, when development team is developing, they give an image, a container to the testing team. They take that image and develop a container 
using softwares, different softwares, and they use that image and then they, they can simply start working on right uh, the testing part. They don't have to worry about the dependencies, OS, uh, OS level dependencies or some other kind of cross functionalities. Once the testing is done, of course, everything works fine. Then you take that application to production. Again, the image is taken. So these, this is the uh, right benefit of having your containers. So more than uh, one isolated service, you can have multiple applications. That's what it, it means. More than one isolated services means I'll have multiple, multiple, multiple uh, services or applications which can be executed on a single computer without having any cross dependencies and cross functionalities issues. So that is the advantage of having containers. So you're going to say, if this is my server, you're going to create a container. It's like image. This is another image. This is another image. This is another image. So you can create multiple images on the same server and you can try and deploy those applications. So application containers contain the same runtime components which are required for that code to or the application to run. So everything is bundled together and shared, right? Libraries, Python libraries, you can say, environment variables with respect to operating system or any other dependent files, etc. Everything is bundled together. The concept of containerization, uh, you have to uh, learn about something called as virtualizations to try and understand why containers are more important or why containerization is getting more popularized now. There's something called as virtualization, where we create virtual machines using this concept. So it's like, this is my server. Physically, there is one big server. I'm going to split this logically and say VM1. So if I have two cores, two CPUs and 16 GB, I can split this into one core, 8 GB machine and another machine is one core, 8 GB. So I'm basically restricting, creating boundaries and creating two computers from the same server, right? So these are hence called as virtual machines. But the problem here is these are heavy, right? There's a lot of hardware uh, dependencies and all that. Whereas containers doesn't deal with this. They, they don't kind of split the hardware. They only take application level, right? So if you have 12 GB, two core system, your containers will work on this only. We are only talking about application level dependencies, right? Not the hardware related. So this is the advantage of having the containers. Now, Heroku is a container-based application. And whenever we talk about container-based application, the first thing which comes into the mind is Docker. People who are familiar with containerization concept or people who are aware of Docker, they, they, they right, know how the Docker works and all that. Right? So they, they really appreciate people who use Docker. They, they kind of, right? I mean, at least I'm a fan, fan of the Docker concept. So generally people fall in love with the Docker uh, concept itself. So the first container, container that, that we can think of is, is Docker based containers. But we have Heroku. So if I have to compare them, there are a lot of benefits that I see in Docker, but it is purely subjective on your application requirements on which platform you want to choose. All right. Mm -hmm. So if I talk about the difference, as I mentioned, Heroku is a platform as a service and is used for building and running your applications. And it uses cloud. Whereas Docker is used for app development. And you can also develop building. This is common, building and running, right? So here also we'll have app development and it is also used for deployment. Here also running means deployment. But this can be done on any machines, okay? Dockers can be done on any machines. It doesn't need to have any hardware dependencies. 
Heroku are the, the other way. It, it requires uh, the Heroku cloud itself. It's a cloud platform. Okay. Then we may say the right uh, uh, Docker, as I mentioned, it can be done on your local machine, a remote server, or any cloud services like Azure or AWS, right? Um, any service, cloud based services. Because of its hardware dependency, we have a vendor lock in. So there are a lot of cross dependencies. Some applications will not work. Okay. Whereas Docker, yes, there's no restriction. Heroku on the side, it's, it's free, but it also has additional cost if you want to increase the application usage. Okay. Then here, Docker is open source. Of course, again, it directly depends on what kind of um, resources you are consuming, the, the cloud platform that you are going to use. So cost is directly incurred to that. As a Docker system itself, it's an open source. Uh, the This is kind of a right, commonality. Heroku uh, allows us to understand multiple languages, mm -hmm. uh, but it is, of course, OS dependent. Right? Heroku containers are, we call it as dynos in Heroku terminology, are OS dependent. It only works on Linux, whereas here, there's no OS dependency at all. Your Docker containers can be containing any operating system. Um, dynos are easily scalable. The same thing here also, we have uh, the pods which can be easily scalable um, for Docker. The disadvantage of course, is that, um, right? Heroku is like readily available platform. You just click and everything is ready. But here in Docker, difficult because of too much of flexibility. Sometimes it becomes difficult to configure and bring in our requirements, right? It has so many options. So it becomes tricky. So this is a quick comparison between Heroku and uh, your uh, uh, Docker. Then uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'll, I'll do the hands-on. I think uh, we are pressing on time. Um, so this is the code uh, repository, GitHub. If you don't have code repository account, um, please look into this, okay? Uh, GitHub is one of the platforms I would personally say is kind of a mandatory for every data scientist, right? So try and have your cloud platform um, and accounts and then your GitHub accounts, your, your uh, Heroku accounts, all these are open source platforms to so ensure that you have them. Of course, cloud, that, that's a different ball game altogether. But Heroku and GitHub mandatory. I would recommend you, you create an account and have your account there. The code that you are going to develop can be right, pushed into the um, GitHub repository and it lies there and you can share that code and all that. So code management becomes easier. You can have publicly um, made available code to the entire world or you can restrict the code access. So all that management is also available in your GitHub platforms. These are series of steps that, that you can use for creating your repository and pushing your code. Uh, we'll not do this. We will be directly doing it uh, using our front-end application, right? And uh, um, I'll, I'll show you a small code uh, to, to uh, run the application on Heroku and GitHub, okay? So let us let us now move to the, um, the hands-on. Um, in the meantime, when, when, by the time I, I bring up all the right application, the code, everything. I would recommend you all to um, post your questions. I'll, I'll try to address the course uh, questions parallelly. So I'll be right um, taking up your questions now. Um, Nitin, uh, do we have any questions? Can you just look into the questions and uh, probably you can uh, share the questions with me. And uh, in a yeah, parallel uh, incidentally, there aren't any questions that I need to share because they were all pretty generic about uh, uh -huh. of experience and um, why am I getting rejected? So I've been responding to them in the chat itself. All right. Uh, one person did ask a question about I never able to deploy correctly. I get stuck up. I told them okay. it will be explained. So I think that is the only thing. Otherwise, it is all pretty much uh, generic stuff. Is two years experience enough? So I've, I've addressed most of them. Hmm. Okay, so let us um, let me just uh, bring up the application. And as I mentioned, it just uh, need to give me a quick minute here so that I can bring up all the applications. So, no. 
app. So just a minute, okay. Please hold on, everyone, and uh, I'll try to give you this. Okay, I have uh, one, one, I'll do one thing. I already have an application deployed on my Heroku. I'll, I'll probably walk you through the process because we don't have much time here. And then, um, right, you can uh, try and um, implement your application using these steps um, uh, for, for, for uh, practice purpose. So I'll not be um, right, kind of showing everything as is, um, but I'll, I'll try to show you something different, okay? I, I have certain challenges with respect to sharing the code and all that. So I was trying to ensure that these things are not shared directly with um, right, everyone because of the NDA clauses, the data security clauses that we have, uh, I'm not supposed to share. Okay, so that's, that's where we stand. Okay, so let me quickly talk about the things that we will be doing um, with respect to um, the applications here. So this is a uh, uh, Heroku platform. The Heroku platform is basically given or developed by Salesforce. It was launched, uh, I think in 1997, or I'm not sure, I cannot recollect the exact year, but it, it's developed by Salesforce. You have to create your Heroku account. It's very simple. You can log, uh, log into your, uh, let's say, Heroku website, right? And you can sign up. Okay, you can just click on this and you can give your account, sign up. Uh, it's it's free account, so you don't have to worry. Just create your free account. Once you get your account, you will be right uh, going into this page. Um, the list of applications that you have probably will be shown here. Okay. And um, um, let me try and delete this application if I can okay let me delete this okay all right so that i can i can show you um, how the look, uh, ui looks like once you log in this is the page that you will see because i don't have any application it says create new app but once you create at least one you will see the new button here. You can you can basically create your app or create a pipeline. Now we want to create an app. So I'll create an app. I will give a app name. I'm saying test app one. Um, not available. Okay, let me say 2210. Yeah, this application name is available. Today is 22nd October, so I'm not giving the date. And you just wait for this confirmation that this application is unique, right, for you. And because it has to create a URL, remember? And that URL is accessible in entire globe, anywhere, any country, you will be able to access this. So ensure that it is unique. So you once you have this URL, uh, you can leave the region as is and then say create pipeline. Oh, sorry, create application pipeline. So you will see this particular uh, page once you click your create application. This is this is basically what you're looking at. You can have a pipeline created. Create a new pipeline. Choose an existing one. Or right, you can do all this. If if you have any pipelines, you can look at the pipelines. These pipelines basically are to connect to your various database uh, data sources and bring the data. Right, those kind of applications. Uh, our discussion is with respect to deployment. And as I said, Heroku needs a core repository connection. You can use the command line interface to connect with your GitHub or Git repository, or directly you can have GitHub connection here. We will be using this particular access, GitHub repository. You can click on this, and it basically um, will ask you to log in to your GitHub account. I have already done this, so it is, it is not asking me for the next time, but if you are doing it for the first time, then it will ask you 
for logging in, there, there will be another page that pops up and it will ask you to give the credentials of your GitHub account. I've connected to the GitHub account and on the GitHub account, you will have to create your repository and ensure that you have the code updated. Okay, once you create the repository, it will ask you to update your code. Okay, so I will say create a new repository. You can give a repository name. I'll say test app 2210. And I'll use the same name there. Uh, I can restrict it. Uh, I don't want this to be used by or uh, this code to be available for everybody. So I'm, I can restrict it. Or you can also ensure that the code is also available for everybody. Um, so that right, people can take the code and do, do some kind of a, right, work on that. Uh, then you can also add all these things. I mean, there are different things that you can do uh, with respect to Git repository. I'm not editing anything. It's just a uh, right, plain, simple repository that I'm creating. Once I have the repository created, uh, there are multiple ways where you can start pushing your content into the repository. The, the simplest one is um, you can just import your code directly, right? I, I can go to the repository and I can try and update the code, okay? Um, these are the instructions that you can look at. But you can also see getting started by creating a new file or updating an existing file. So I'll click on this. This is the best way uh, to dump the entire code that you need. You can drag your content here, the code content here. Um, I'll try and do this. Application templates, car, these things I'm, I'm trying to drag and drop. But one important thing that we need is the requirements file, which is not there here. So what I do is I'll, I'll use this particular application um, because the, for this application, I have the right uh, deployment, um, the, the proc file and the requirements done. Let me show you the requirements file. For this particular quote, we are talking about all the libraries that are required. Okay, these are basically creating the environment. So all those libraries that are required, these things will get installed in our application. Okay, so let me try and store this as well. I'll drag and drop here so that I get requirements file. I'll also try and update the prop file. This is also a text file. Let me try and open this with notepad. Sorry. Yeah, I'll say notepad. And this is all we have. This is one line small instruction. This is the standard instruction that we will have. Okay. So I will also update the prop file. Let us go to this. Okay, that's all. Um, I have templates file. I have the code. Code is not required, of course, but I have done that. The app file, the requirements file, and the prop file. I'll commit the changes. This is your code repository. This is where your code is updated, right? So I Python notebook, the Python file, all these things are there. Now let us go to the test application here. I'll, I'll take the question. I think there is one question. Now, once I have connected to the GitHub, you can do a simple search or you can start typing your name test application right so I'll, I'll try to type the test and say search this is the application that i have if you're not sure of the name you can just say search and it will list out all the applications your repository names here all the repositories so this is the repository that i've created hopefully this works because i'm taking the requirements from a different code and all of that 
once I have updated everything, once I have connected, you can see disconnect button is showing, right? So that means it's connected from Heroku to GitHub repository. The connection is activated. Now I want to deploy. You can basically say automatic deployments. You can do that or manual deploy. So you can say deploy the branch. You choose main and say deploy the branch. This would probably take a little while for taking up all the requirements that your application has. Okay, all those dependencies uh, that it has, it's, it's trying to build it. And once the environment is ready, you will see a confirmation that the deployment is successful. And if once it is there, you can just click on the link and you'll get the UI. So let me just see the question in the meantime. I have created my Heroku account two months back. Uh, if I log in again, it's asking for authentication code. How can I get this? I'm not getting any email. Uh, do check in your promotions and the spam folder as well. Um, there could be an issue with that. Uh, cross check into these folders also. And uh, yeah, you just delete your account and probably recreate your account uh, if that's not working. Um, I mean, it's, it should not be a, a big problem. It should be a trivial issue. Uh, just check in your spam folders or promotion folders. Okay. So coming back to this, uh, you can see as the screen, uh, right? Everything is shown as green. All the tick marks are there. And it says that deployment is ready and your application was successfully deployed. And you can click on view. I click on the view and look at this. This is the Heroku application that we created, right? This is your application and you can see the URL. This is the name and this is your standard URL that you get. Now, in this case, I will probably give my input. Remember, we were trying to identify the uh, fuel efficiency of some vehicle. So I'm randomly giving these numbers just to show you the result. And when I click on submit, the, the mileage is showing here. So I have done everything on my local machine. I have put my code repository in GitHub and I deployed the application. Application, mind you, not the Python code that is being asked for the end user to be executed. We are giving a URL so that the customer can feed in the input and we get the output for the customer. So this is uh, basically how your uh, right, code can be maintained. Now, any changes that you are making here, obviously will be happening into your code repository and the connection is live here. So every time when there is right uh, some kind of an update happening, you can also have this refreshed, your application can be refreshed and you will see that the changes are being taken care of. Uh, you, you basically right, kind of refresh the deployment and all the changes that you're making will take into effect. It's just a click of a button again. And it also maintains the version. All right. um, the, there is a question. I think we are pressing for the time. I'll take up this question. And uh, if you have any questions, you can post those questions on uh, the channel. We will be taking up and I'll, I'll try to add, uh, respond to your questions uh, post the session as well. Uh, the question says how to create a recruitment uh, re requirement uh, recruitment.txt file. It's it's requirement.txt. It's not recruitment.txt uh, file. Um, it's it's basically a requirements.txt file. The requirements text file is talking about all the Python packages which you need for deployment. So these are, I mean, any Python code that you are developing or writing, it will require certain packages to be readily available. Eventually, you'll get to know this. When you run, you'll get error. You will be able to see what package is missing, and then you add the key to the requirement files. When you are doing any code in your Python uh, Spider or Jupyter Notebooks in your local machine, you might get to see these errors, right? Like module not found or code is not executing because of function not available. 
then you know that yes, these are the minimum libraries that I need to have, right? So requirements.txt file will contain the packages which you require for your application to work. Okay. So eventually you'll have to figure out these libraries. You will come to. Okay. All right. So hope you have enjoyed the session. Hope you have learned how the deployment uh, can be done so that the end user can actually look at this web interface rather than the code. So we'll look forward to connect again in the next session. And uh, thank you so much for connecting. Please subscribe to 360 Digital MG channel. We will come up with next week with a new tool and we will explain how to use that tool for deployment, managing your code, managing your application, capturing the drift in the applications, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Sharat. Yeah, we my pleasure by a minute. But yeah, thank you so much, Sharat. Uh, like Sharat said, uh, please do like, subscribe, share, uh, and let everybody know and happy Diwali. Wish you a very happy Diwali, friends, and uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much.